Hello, welcome to mini lecture one for our course. This mini lecture addresses cross-cultural encounters and specifically addresses Columbus's voyages to the New World and subsequent European colonialism in the Americas. The image that you see on the screen is a painting of Our Lady of the Navigators by Alejo Fernandez. This painting was completed in 1535 and was an altarpiece for a church in Seville, Spain. If you look closely at this painting, you'll see that you have the image of the Virgin Mary, um, venerated by Catholics in Spain. And under her cloak, you have several groups of figures. This is meant to be, on the far left, Christopher Columbus, and various European travelers to the New World. You notice at the bottom you have ships, the types of ships that would have brought Europeans to the Americas. Interestingly, in the background, under the cloak, you can see very, not very well, but you can see Native Americans. This is one of the first depictions of Native Americans in European art. And notice how they're somewhat shrouded and obscured from view. And they're also included under the Cloak of Mary, which is consistent with Europeans' efforts to convert Native Americans to Christianity. Now, why did Europeans explore the Americas? There are several reasons. The collapse of the Mongol Empire and the rise of the Ottoman Empire effectively cut off Europe from trade with Asia. We'll look at a few maps where I can explain that further in a moment. Europeans were seeking a new trade route to Asia, and there was also a desire to spread Christianity throughout the globe. So there were both economic and religious motivations for searching for for a trade route for, to Asia, and also seeking to spread Christianity. The traditional trade route that Europeans used to travel to Asia was the Silk Road, which is depicted on the right. The Silk Road was not you know, a paved road like we would think of today. It was a, a network of um, paths, routes, uh, through the steppes of Central Asia, essentially. Um, all the way from Europe to China. This Silk Road was protected by the Mongols. The Mongols established a vast empire throughout the steppes of Central Asia, and as a result of Mongol rule, European travelers could travel along the Silk Road in relative safely, even carrying very um, expensive goods. However, the Mongol Empire disintegrated um, in, the, in the 13th and 14th centuries. Uh, the Mongol Empire was broken up into various warring factions. So into the, gold, you know, the Golden Horde and various other khanates that were at war with each other, essentially. As a result, the Silk Road became totally impassable. Now, there was another possible route that Europeans could travel to Asia, and that was by sailing through the Eastern Mediterranean, crossing the Sinai, and sailing down the Red Sea into the Indian Ocean. The problem with this route was the emergence of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire um, expanded during this period, and by the 15th century, came to dominate the area around the Red Sea, making this route impassable as well. So both of the traditional trade routes to Asia were blocked. Technological developments were important as well. The rise of powerful monarchies in Europe created established governments that had the money necessary to launch great expeditions into the sea. The Portuguese developed more accurate maps, thanks in part to the discovery of the cartographic knowledge of the classical age and Muslim scholars during the Renaissance. Latitude and longitude began to be used by Europeans for navigational purposes. Europeans improved Arab navigational tools, such as the compass and the astrolabe. And Portugal and Spain developed more seaworthy ships, adopting the Latin sail from Arab merchants. 
The Portuguese were the first to try to discover a new trade route to Asia, and they did so by sailing around the continent of Africa. This was a very long voyage, um, and it took many decades to successfully complete. By 1441, the Portuguese had reached the Senegal River. By 1471, they had reached the Gold Coast of West Africa. By 1478, Bartolomeo Diaz sails around the Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of the African continent. And by 1498, Vasco da Gama reaches India. The Portuguese, based on their voyages, were able to establish a vast trading empire in Asia. By 1510, the Portuguese had established trading outposts on the west coast of India. By 1511, they had conquered the port city of Malacca on the Malaysian Peninsula. And by 1550, the Portuguese had a network of trading outposts in Indonesia, the Philippine Islands, and China. This would ultimately lead to uh, a slave trade as well. The Portuguese would establish trading outposts on the west coast of Africa, typically with the permission of the kingdoms and rulers of West Africa. And ultimately, the Portuguese and then other European powers would begin to purchase human beings as slaves from the west coast of Africa. After the Americas were discovered by Europeans in 1492, the Americas create the discovery of the Americas and the conquest of the Americas by Europeans created a demand for slave labor in the Americas. Europeans established mines and plantations in the Americas and then needed individuals to work on these plantations and to work in these mines. And uh, by the 16th century, you see the development of a slave trade from Europeans purchasing human beings in West Africa and transporting them to labor in their colonies in the Americas. African kingdoms and merchants exchange slaves for iron, guns, rum, and other goods. Christopher Columbus was born in Genoa in a port city in the north of Italy in 1451. We know relatively little about him. He was the son of a weaver. By the 1470s, he was involved in the sugar trade in the um, eastern part of the Atlantic Ocean. We do know a bit about what he read. He read, read widely about the lives of the saints. He also read chivalric fiction about the lives of knights. He married a minor noblewoman. Um, Columbus was a commoner himself, but he clearly had aspirations to rise in social status. And so he married a minor member of the um, Portuguese nobility. Columbus presented many different rationales for a voyage into the Atlantic Ocean. He told different people different things at different times. He claimed that he was searching for new islands at times. At other times, he claimed that he was searching for a new trade route to China, that he was seeking to discover new lands and convert, quote, pagans. At times, Columbus stated that he was trying to conquer Jerusalem by sailing west into the Atlantic. And he also, at times, claimed that he was seeking to discover the mythical kingdom of Prester John. Um, a kingdom that was said to exist in the, in the East, ruled by a Christian king. His, his personal motivation was to achieve honor and social status, primarily. Columbus needed money for the voyage. Ferdinand and Isabella at first rejected Columbus's plan in January of 1492. Ferdinand and Isabella were the king and queen um, of Spain. They rejected his plan partly because it seemed unlikely to succeed. Sailing west into the Atlantic um, would likely result in the death of Columbus and all of his crew. Um, Louis de Saint-Angel, the treasurer to the king, intervened and convinced Ferdinand and Isabella to support the voyage. Louis de Saint-Angel thought that Columbus might discover some, a trade route of economic value by sailing west. So a contract was signed on April 17, 1492. 
bankers in Seville and court officials in Castile and Aragon loaned money to the king and queen so that they could finance this voyage. On August 3rd, Columbus set sail with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, to the Canary Islands. On September 6th, he departed from the Canary Islands and continued his voyage west. On October 12th, he arrived in the Bahamas, in the Caribbean, most likely Watling Island. He traveled on from there to what today we would call Cuba and Hispaniola. He encountered Native American peoples known as the Taino in his voyages. Columbus would ultimately make four voyages to the Americas. Columbus, on his first voyage, um, the Santa Maria, the largest of his ships, ran aground in December of 1492 on the island of Hispaniola. In his journal, Columbus wrote, it was a great blessing and the express purpose of God that the ship should run aground. Columbus ordered the construction of a fort on Hispaniola using, in part, the wood from the destroyed ship. Thirty-nine men were left behind at this fort. Um, and when Columbus returned on his second voyage, all 39 men would be dead. We don't know if they were killed in conflict with the natives or died of disease or some combination. Columbus asserted that he had discovered a route to Asia. He referred to the native peoples he encountered as Indians as a result. The rewards that were promised to him in, a, in the contract that he signed were based on his discovery of a trade route to Asia, so it was imperative that Columbus claim that he discovered this route to Asia. Most Europeans were in fact very skeptical that Columbus had reached Asia. Columbus returned to Europe with captive Taino, parrots, unknown plants, and a small quantity of gold. Christopher Columbus authored a letter on his first voyage. Um, he composed the letter in February of 1493 on his return voyage to Spain, and by May of 1493, Spanish and Latin versions of the letter were published. The Spanish letter was addressed to Louis de Saint Angel, the finance minister of to Ferdinand II. Columbus issues a very positive report on the resources available in Hispaniola. He says there is that the native inhabitants wear gold, uh, that the land is fertile, that there are a great many resources that Spain could exploit. He reports that the natives seem peaceful and that they, in any case, don't have any weapons suitable for war. He does discuss the possibility of converting the natives to Christianity, and he promises great wealth for the Spanish Empire. He's trying to sell the Spanish crown on the idea of financing a second voyage. On the second voyage, Columbus brings 17 ships with 1,200 men. The garrison fort, as I mentioned, had been destroyed. There are no survivors. Columbus establishes a base on Hispaniola. He takes 500 Taino as prisoners and sends them back to Europe as slaves. And he establishes a systematic search for gold. All of the Taino are required to search for gold and turn over several ounces of gold to the Spanish every few months. When they turn over these the requisite amount of gold to the Spanish, they receive a copper token that's engraved and put around their neck. Taino who were found without the updated copper tokens would have their hands cut off. So it was an incredibly brutal system. The Spanish crossed the Taino. There was an uprising of the Taino, not surprisingly, against the Spanish, but the Spanish had superior weapons and crushed this uprising. The Native American population on Hispaniola was virtually wiped out. In 1494, the Pope negotiated a treaty between Spain and Portugal, where they divvied up the world between themselves. Under the Treaty of Tordesillas, a line was established uh, across the globe. Anything to the west of that line was reserved for Spanish settlement, exploitation, conquest. Anything to the east of the line was reserved to Portuguese for Portuguese settlement and exploitation. Of course, none of the Protestant nations of Europe recognize the legitimacy of this agreement. Thank you for your time. 
this concludes our mini lecture.